You Booked It, episode 29. Hey, entertainers and performers of the world. I'm your host, Dane Reese, and welcome to You Booked It, where I chat with inspiring entertainers seven days a week. By digging into their journey, we're going to discover everything you need to do to be a successful entertainer. You know, because... Training usually skips that part about how to actually make your skills work for you in the real world. Fellow entertainers, my drive here at You Booked It is to share the inspiring and incredible journeys of successful entertainers. We are here to support your journey. So go to youbookeditpodcast.com and join the You Booked It email community where we dig deep into truly actionable things you can be doing right now to help you book that next audition, submission, or gig. If you enjoy this free podcast, please show your support and search for You Booked It on Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast app where you can subscribe so you don't miss an episode, leave a rating, and review. And to show our appreciation for your, fingers crossed, five-star rating and review, I will give you a shout-out on an upcoming episode. And now, let's do this. All righty, let's get started. I am excited to introduce my guest today, Dan Michike. Are you ready for this, Dan? I am. Brilliant. Dan is the music director and conductor of the Broadway smash Wicked, going on his sixth year with the company. Before Wicked, he played Mary Sunshine in Chicago on Broadway, as well as six years with the national and international tours, including the Japanese and Thailand companies. He's performed at Carnegie Hall and the Kennedy Center with Bernstein's Mass. Recordings include Bernstein's Mass, which won a grant which won a Grammy nomination in 2008, 54 Below with Jessica Vosk and Patrick Page. Workshops include Stu for Silverton. He also teaches master classes at major universities and colleges throughout the country. He is a New York City voice coach, and he received his degree from the Boston Conservatory in 2007. Now, Dan, that is a quick intro of who you are and what you've done, but Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, fill in the gaps, who you are, and a little bit more about what you do as a professional in the entertainment industry. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, Dane, for having me. Um, It's a pleasure to be here and chat with you all. And uh, especially during this crazy time in the world. um, Yeah. So basically, as Dane said, um, I've been with with Wicked for multiple years now thank god and uh hopefully when we get back up and running sooner than later um many more years to come um let's see i grew up in connecticut darianne connecticut and um started obviously going to see broadway shows with my mom like from third grade on and then started studying in the city on the weekends and uh I always knew I wanted to go to Boston Conservatory ever since like around ninth or 10th grade um, for many reasons and um, went to Boston for four years, was a great experience and moved to the city uh, 2007, right after graduating. Uh, been there ever since, uh, except when I've been out of town working and um, now we're actually back living in Connecticut, thankfully. Um, we uh, closed and bought a house two weeks after the Broadway show shut down, which was planned, moving to back to the country. And uh, we'll be a commuter once Broadway shows open up again. But um, just been busy and busy and busy with uh, working on projects in the house and realizing different hobbies that I have and missing work every single day. Um, But a little bit about my job um, as music director and conductor of the show. Obviously, I conduct the show, uh, maintain the musical integrity of the show, um, along with my supervisor, Stephen Arimus, and uh, direct communication with producers, director, associate director, choreographer, associate choreographer, and casting for both the Broadway and the National Company. Fantastic. Well, let's move on to the next section here. And Dan, I am a sucker for a good quote. 
What is your favorite quote you'd like to share with our listeners? When preparation meets opportunity, that's when things really happen in your career. I could not agree more. And could you expand on that a little bit on how you've applied that to your daily life and your career? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, getting a degree in music theater and um, a little emphasis in music direction from the brilliant Kathy Rand at Boston Conservatory. I mean, working in New York as a Broadway actor to making a transition um, as a music director on Broadway um, definitely took a lot of uh, preparation. And in a lot of ways, you know, preparation in me, myself as a musician, as a conductor, um, as well as making the networking connections I needed to make in this business, because it's all about who you know and the working relationships you keep um, and flourish in this business. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought up the relationships needed because I think a lot of people think that they can show up, book a big job, and then they're set. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's so much more than that. The fact that you are brilliantly talented and you can do the job is really just the given. It's really those relationships that create the longevity out of a career, that keep the calls coming in, and all those opportunities flowing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I live my life in many ways on a daily reprieve, but really in this industry, whether you're a musician, actor, stagehand, stage manager, really anywhere in this business, you got to show up. Showing up meaning you show up to any and any audition you can find and you show up prepared. That means with your material, as you look, the way you carry yourself, the attitude you have about yourself, the confidence you have about yourself. And then when you do book that big job that does help shape your career, you have to then keep applying and constantly show up eight shows a week. Um, and, you know, those are the people I always just want to work with. And those are the people that have those 10, 15, 20 Broadway show careers because you know what you're going to get with that person. Many a times people like rest on their laurels and they're like, um, I got it, boo. And this is that. And then they just kind of sit back. And that is very, you can see that. Um, and people want to work with hardworking people that have a good time. And that's one of the biggest things in this business. You have to be clear in what you want, but also, and, and be immersed in the industry, but also to be a person and to be able to talk about how's the weather? What are you doing this weekend? What's going on at home? So it's not only about, you know, I just did this reading and this workshop and this and that. People want to work with people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's move on to this next section. And Dan, of course, you are an entertainer. I'm an entertainer. And I think you would agree that this industry can be one of the most subjective, brutally honest, personally emotional industries that either of us have probably experienced. And you know as well as I that in order to create and to have a successful career in this industry like you're having now takes a lot of dedication and hard work. And while, yeah, there is an outrageous amount of fun and excitement doing what we do, there are also our fair share of obstacles and challenges and failures we are going to inevitably experience and we're going to have to learn how to move forward through them. So tell us, what is one key challenge, obstacle, or failure you've experienced in your career and how did you come out the other side better because of it? I think I really needed to learn how to listen to everything I was being told um, as an actor and working in the city as an actor and then as a musician, but not listening to everything I was told. So really being picky and cultivating the relationships with people and listening to them. And even with people that I'm not even close with anymore, taking away, you can learn something from everyone and any opportunity you have. I mean, I remember just out of the gate, and hopefully this speaks to a lot of 
recent um, graduates, um, we have this crazy showcase at the end of the year when we graduate college and I got nothing from it. And um, I remember that day just being like, okay. And, and I left that meeting with all my colleagues and um, professor and I was like, all right, here we go. I'm jumping in. And it kind of just was a determination. Um, and then what, the same thing when I switched my career as a musician to a music director, it was just not having an ego about anything. Sharpening pencils for whoever at Carol Music, being in the room, being around the people that are influential, learning from them, um, and really taking any job that would come my way. But the biggest obstacle I, would, I found was um, not putting all my eggs in one basket and kind of being burned by someone who was quote unquote like mentoring me early on um, and just keeping my options open um, and not listening to just one or two teachers in Manhattan. Um, there's a lot of people that teach and there's a lot of people that coach and you're going to get a lot of different conflicting information. You need to pick and choose what is going to be right for you. I love that. And moving forward to the next section now, this is a time that I like to call your spotlight moment, that one moment in time that you realized, yes, I am going to be an entertainer for a living. Or maybe it was, yes, this is what I need to be doing as an entertainer. Tell us about that. It was two different spots. First one was in first grade. I was in my stroller at Hershey Park. And I turned around, there was tap dancers on a stage. And I turned around to my mom and I said, I want to do that. And I started out as a tap dancer before anything. And um, that really was the defining moment in my life, even though I was so young. Yeah, um, I love that. I really knew I wanted to live in this industry. And then I remember in middle school, I would always and still just listen to cast albums. And I remember asking my mom, I was like, people like get paid for this. I would like, so do this for free. Looking back on it now, I was like, honey, show me that check. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember thinking that I was like, wow, like people, like people make a living doing this. And that you is, can't even imagine it would be work. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was like, work. You kidding? You got to be on Broadway every night. Looking back now, I mean, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of, I hate using the word sacrifices in life, but like, you know, it's a lot of curbing to a lifestyle that goes with this world. Yeah. I really, I really knew so early on that I just wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Um, just to be in the theater. Yeah. And can you, can you talk about your transition from performing in Chicago and then getting to the MD world? Yeah. So like I was always a coach in college and I would always play music direct things. And I realized senior year, I was like, I need to like do this for the rest of my life, but I got to go beyond Broadway as an actor. I just have to do that in my life. And when I got to the city, I was told by a lot of people, to not play the piano for people because, um, you know, there's a lot of actors in New York, but if you can find a pianist that can sight read really fast, you're going to work. Probably about a year and a half in of being in the city, I needed to work, even though I was doing Chicago every night, um, I started coaching. And I really, really loved working with singers and still obviously do. And the thing I love about it the most is I get to get them to a place that is succeeding for them, not just vocally, but melding the wor worlds between vocally to interpretation and then to support. I mean, there's many times where I'm like, okay, this needs to be better, but to support the actor and the artist, because I remember a lot of times as an actor, um, I didn't always get that from the music side. And about around 2010, I got a call from Adam Gettle, um, who was looking for a pianist for some of his classes in the city. And my name got to him and he was like, can you come over to my apartment and audition for me? And I played 
you got to get a gimmick from Gypsy. That's what he wanted to hear. And I was like, <laughs> that's my jam, honey. And uh, he was like, great, you're hired and let's work together. And he was the first person that was really big to be like, you need to music direct for the rest of your life. And I remember thinking, well, if this guy thinks I have talent, then maybe I do. And uh, because it was a very much of like, no, you're an actor. Like, you're not going to, you're not going to get, you know, acknowledgement from the mu musician world. Um, Cause the musician world is even smaller than the acting community in New York. Right. I can imagine people were quick to put you in a box and to define you as one thing or another thing. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to remember, I was like, at this point, I was already doing three years straight as a male soprano playing Mary Sunshine. I mean, you know, I was this kid wanting to be, you know, and I was only 25 at the time. And um, he really, really helped me. Um, and then I became good friends with Stephen Schwartz. Um, and he was like, you know, whatever way I can help you as well. And cultivating those relationships as friends, you know, not just being like, this is business, this is work, you know, as a friend. And, and to this day, I mean, Schwartz lives five minutes away from us in Connecticut and we go on our walks every three weeks. And, um, but really the turning point was Stephen Aremus, who I owe a lot to, um, supervisor of Wicked, um, Book of Mormon, Frozen, Avenue Q, uh, you know, half of Broadway. Um, right. And uh, he got my name once again from another music director. And they were looking for a keyboard one player on the first national. And I got a phone call that they were looking at me and wondering my availability and if I can come in and play. And I was on a plane back to Japan um, to go do uh, another company of Chicago out there. And that was the moment I knew in my career where I was like, I have to make a decision here if I want to be looked at as solely a musician in Manhattan, or I want to be this actor, or I want to like blur this line and see what happens. And um, when I got back from Japan, I turned down all acting work. Um, and I actually turned down a lot of contracts to go back with Chicago because I was like, I need to focus my energy on the, I also didn't want to perform anymore, but I need to focus my energy on where and how I want to be perceived in this industry. And I knew that I couldn't do tour one and didn't get hired either, but I knew that they would call one day, either they called next month in six months or in a year. And, um, I practiced that piano vocal every single day for probably three months. And Aremus and I ran into each other on ninth Avenue, blah, 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 blah. He wrote me the next morning and he's like, there's an opening on tour two. Um, can you come into my apartment and play the score for me? And I went on tour 10 days later. Um, wow. And I was out there for four years um, before I took over. I, I took over as music director out there as well, but started out as key three, um, assistant to the assistant conductor and worked my way up. And um, which is another key lesson in asking for what you want and also knowing what you're worth and being aggressive about it, but in a welcoming way. <laughs> And so, um, and a lot of it was, you know, stars were aligned and I busted my ass, but I also know how lucky I am and fortunate. And I've never been prouder to work for, and to this day, I've never been prouder to work for such a phenomenal company like Wicked um, from the top down. And, um, and that's kind of like a whole real quick journey of the progression. I love it. Well, let's piggyback on that a little bit. And let's talk about your number one booked it moment. And walk us through that day, the whole process, auditions and callbacks, if those happen to be a part of it, what was going on in your life? And what about that moment makes it your favorite booked it moment? I think it was the day I got Chicago. 
I've always been a very much of an old soul and still think that, you know, uh, the eighties and nineties of Broadway were like the best times. And Chicago is really has always spoke to me um, since I was a little kid. And the way I got that show was I crashed an EPA of the show as non-union and went in to sing Mary Sunshine. And they were like, great, you're going to come back in a couple months when we have an opening. And I was like, yeah, right. And I just graduated college and I really wanted my equity card. So after an exorbitant amount of callbacks, I finally booked a theater works tour. And um, I got a phone call four weeks later saying that there was an opening on Broadway, the national, the Japanese, Thailand, and Alaskan companies of Chicago. And what? Um, they wanted to see me as Mary Sunshine. And uh, it was very fast. Um, the initial audition appointment, I was the last one of the day and they were seeing Mary Sunshines for seven hours. God bless. And um, it was the one day I didn't have to be on tour. Loose, quote unquote, tour um, with my children's theater show. And also at the time I was like, I've arrived. Like I'm working as an equity actor, you know, making $400 a week. I, I was, I'm so grateful for those times. And I think everyone in this industry um, should do jobs like that before they, you know, get to um, Broadway or something like that. And uh, I went in and sang and was in the audition room for probably about 15, 20 minutes. And I left and I was like, something just happened. I don't know. Like I was like full on rehearsing for a show right there. And I didn't hear for like three days. I went back out on my tour driving the theater works van. And they said they want to see me in four days for a callback. Well, this became very dramatic and I won't go into too much of the detail, but I did not have an understudy and I had a show. And so I, called casting and I was like, hi, 22 years old. And I was like, I'm doing this theater work show and we're going to be in Princeton, New Jersey. And um, I know you want to see me for a final callback, but is there any way we can move it later in the day? And they were like, this is for Walter Bobby and the Weislers. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> and so it was a very roundabout day about getting in there and um, it, was the f it was four of us for final callbacks. I went in. It was just like the Broadway dream audition I've always dreamed of as a kid. Very old school, which I loved. And, you know, like 10 people behind the table, producer still in his suit. Very old school. And um, Rob Fisher, the music director, supervisor, was like, um, how long have you been singing like that? And I was like, oh, a year and a half. Because I really didn't sing male soprano until senior year of college. I went home and walked home and walked up Ninth Avenue and a bird shat on my head. And I picked up a $10 bill on the street and I came home and my agent at the time was like, pick up the phone in 10 minutes and they offered me like a three-year contract. Wow. And they were like, you'll start rehearsal next week. Uh, you'll have three days and then you'll open. I mean, it was a whirlwind. And I, that was like quintessential Broadway moment for me. Getting Wicked was other level and in many other ways. But like that was like, oh my God, I'm going to be on Broadway. You did it. That was like the first validation of the dream that you'd had for so long. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my gosh. I love that story. <laughs> well, let's take a moment to talk about the present. What projects are you working on now? What are you looking forward to? And look, of course, we're amidst this global pandemic. How do you see the entertainment industry moving forward in the next couple of years? Well, the projects I'm working on right now is my lawn uh, my garden. <laughs> I mean, literally, like I have fallen in love with uh, yard work and just house projects. And so that has been very 
very fulfilling for me, very meditative uh, and a way to keep in the present because if I do not, I will totally future trip and the whole world will be on fire in a week and I'll, you know. So uh, the projects really, I mean, from the industry part, I'm really not working on anything because I, I thank God still with Wicked and will be when we open up again. Um, but what's keeping me artistically fulfilled is I'm coaching still a lot on um, FaceTime and Zoom and I'm doing some virtual masterclasses, um, which have been really, really wonderful and fulfilling for me. And I'm still able to connect with artists and singers and actors and playing a lot of piano myself that I haven't been at, had a chance to. And really a lot of it has been time to spend with my fiance and we've never had this much time together learning about each other, um, cooking so much, again, yard work and house projects and taking advantage of this time, which I've never really had more than three days off in a row and um, looking, looking back on things, keeping things into perspective because it is a very stressful, uh, mostly economical, stressful, uh, uncertain time. But um, our producers have been extremely wonderful and communicative to us and thank god you know as wicked we will be back um we just don't know when for sure and the way i see the industry changing i mean hopefully in the way of the virus uh it will be a much cleaner place to work and not just the industry but manhattan um which is needed for a very long time but also with what's the horrific things that are going on in the world with um racism and yeah. uh, the things that need to be so talked about and not just talked about, but be put into uh, work and to understanding on how to get this industry finally more diverse and opening up the opportunities to people. And, you know, I was mentioning, you know, more open calls and let's get people in the doors, you know, and I don't know if that's a lot of, you know, me as the actor wanting to give the opportunities and remember standing online for hours and not being seen. And so let's put in the time to, you know, get people through the door and think outside of the box with casting and not just casting, but in higher up positions and in management and in the creative parts of our industry where we can all be working cohesively with respect and have opportunities for everyone. Absolutely. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe we'll, the whole of getting seen and seeing more people, maybe it'll be to bit of the hybrid between the tech side that we everyone is experiencing so much of in zoom and more more submission style which is you know i know actors equity likes to be very traditional in the way they do things but maybe this is also going to shed light on maybe some opportunities to allow more people to get that exposure through submissions and at least be a first cut you know yeah, that's already been talked about, uh, thankfully, and once again, a testament to our producers and our show. And nationally, you know, really having national submissions, at least to get in the door, sing 16 bars and we'll see it, you know, and we'll go from there. But so many times, you know, people don't think about it. it's not just union, non-union, um, the way things are cast and, you know, stereotypes. But if you're not in New York... And you can't afford a plane ticket or can't afford a hotel. How are you going to get to the opportunity? So let's go to them. Let's, let's open up the door for that and, and see what talent is out there and then hone it. So we, and, and I, I I think of it as something that must be done, but also something that's very exciting. And I mean, I am always a person that wants to work with someone new, um, that's incredibly talented and exciting. And so if we can work on an initiative to open up that door and opportunity constantly and keep moving forward over the next many years, I think that would be wonderful. I agree. Well, let's move on to one of my favorite sections in the interview. I call it the grease lightning round. 
I am going to ask you a handful of questions. I want you to answer them as quickly and concisely as possible, one after another. Are you ready? Yes. All righty. First question. What was the one thing holding you back from committing to a career as an entertainer? Nothing. Love it. <laughs> Second question. What is the best piece of advice you have ever received? Shut your mouth and listen. So true. Third question. What is something that is working for you now? Or if you'd like to go pre-COVID, what was working for you before our industry went on pause? Um, I have a wonderful uh, group of friends and people in my life that are a huge support group. And that works for me. Um, having people not just in this industry and as well as people in this industry and having an outlet to go um, has been life changing and life affirming. Um, and also um, I had a big uh, awakening in my life a little over two years ago. Um, and that, that has uh, changed my life in every aspect. Great. Is that something you'd want to talk about here or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to actually. Um, I actually, uh, two years and a month ago, um, I got sober and uh, sobriety is a huge part of my journey. And um, it is, it saved my life and the work to go into that and the, not just stopping your addictions and going through 12 steps and having a support group. It's what it gives to you. You know, we always say a life uh, bigger than our wildest dreams. And that is the truth. I mean, it's a daily reprieve. It's work every day, but the gifts and the opportunities um, it has shown me from the hell I was living um, at a personal level it is, uh, it's the biggest reward I've ever had in my life, but that is what's working for me now. And um, that is, I was granted with a lot of gifts before that, but um, I'm able to now really um, relish with the things that are in my life, both personally and professionally because of that. I love that. And the fourth question, what is the best resource, whether it is a book, a movie, a YouTube video, maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's a piece of technology that you found is helping your career right now. I would always say YouTube. Always. I love the history of our industry and the performers and musicians. And I, I learn a lot by watching and listening. And I think YouTube is an incredible source of knowledge. Um, and I'll watch conductors and their technique of conducting and how they interact with musicians and actors, which is a very different way with those two. And um, I find it very inspiring. I mean, let alone I'll go down a rabbit hole probably three times a week of just Liza Minnelli all day because she's my yeah. girl. But um, yeah, I'd say YouTube and my yard work and uh, and always a good podcast, but usually I'm always listening to something like um, Mo Brady's uh, The Ensemblist or uh, Behind the Curtain. I love that podcast um, and a lot of interview podcasts. Fantastic. And the fifth question, if you had to start your career from scratch, but you still had all the knowledge and experience you've collected from your career in the industry, what would you do or not do? Would you do anything differently or would you keep it the same? Oof. I don't know because I think everything I've done in my life with the good and bad like has led me to this point. Um, I, it's easier said than done, but I would say, you know, not, you know, totally lose my mind over like what people think of me and you know how I'm being perceived and especially as an actor it was very hard for me and um you know just that busyness in the head but every actor I talk to says that you know I mean I think we're in an industry where we're judged every day <laughs> you know I know yeah. that sounds harsh but like we are and that's not 
normal. That's really weird. I would say that is probably the main thing. Yes, trusting it's all going to work out. But like right now, yes, I can trust as much as I can, but it's still really freaking scary of what's going to happen, you know, with uh, the world and um, my career and life. And, you know, it'll be okay. And hopefully be better than I think. But um, I would say I really wouldn't change a lot. I, I'm very grateful for the experiences I've had so far, the both the good and the bad and the hard. For sure. I mean, it, all those things shape us. And it, it certainly is the conundrum of that question, isn't it? Because it's all the good and the bad that make us or put us where we are in any moment. Mm. But that's why I like that question. <laughs> anyway, the last question. What is the golden nugget knowledge drop you've learned from your successful career in this industry you'd like to leave with our listeners? I think it's a culmination of everything we've kind of talked about in the last 40 minutes of saying, you know, preparation meets opportunity, preparation meets opportunity, and preparation meets opportunity. And trusting the relationships that I have had and cultivate in this industry and also trusting when someone says that's good work just take it and and don't circle on that for days and be like what can i do better and this and that just be in the moment and in the present but i would kind of say what i mentioned before the uh question before this of you know I I wouldn't change a lot in what has happened in my career over the last 13 years um, because I think everything has led me to the wonderful position that I'm in. Um, but I would honestly just always say preparation meets opportunity. Watch your mouth with opening it up sometimes and gratitude just gratitude, gratitude, and to live in gratitude as much as you can, because that's a wonderful place to live. And this is a wonderful, wonderful, fulfilling industry to work in, but it's very hard. And gratitude, and not just meaning gratitude for your career, gratitude for the sunshine out today, gratitude that you're healthy, gratitude that you have your five senses, gratitude, you know, gratitude for all that will only help you as an artist and uh, really keep alive in this industry. I think that's incredible advice. And it's quite clear after talking with you throughout this entire interview that you truly do embody gratitude for your entire life, professionally and personally. I love that. Thank you. And To wrap up this interview, it is time to give yourself a plug. Where can we find you? How do our listeners connect with you? Is there anything you want to promote? Yes. Um, You can find me on Instagram. My name, D-A-N-M-I-C-C-I-C-H-E, Dan Michike. Um, But also in my Instagram bio, um, there's a link to what you can click on and um, my coaching schedule is on there. So you can pick a time to work with me, singers, actors, musicians, conductors, whatever. And um, to talk about whatever you need, questions, advice, um, and then to coach any kind of material you want. You get an MP3 of whatever songs you want to coach, and then we can go through it in whatever you need, uh, what I can ever be the most of service to you um, in the work you need to work on during this time. Fantastic. Dan, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show today and to talk. Thanks, Dane. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure as well. Give it up for today's five-star reviewers, Ryan Favorite, Woofy202, and Jonathan Bentley. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for joining us today. My one call to action for you is to go to youbookeditpodcast.com and join our free email community, where we dig deep into a continually growing resource of truly actionable things you can be doing right now to help you advance your entertainment career. Don't miss an episode. We have a new guest seven days a week. 
Search for You Booked It on Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast app and subscribe today. All the best to you. We'll see you tomorrow.